Hello, my name is Clara Mavella and I set up the Cultural Entrepreneurship Institute. Today, Sharon Terry is my guest. We are in Berlin at the Charité Entrepreneurship Summit. Welcome to our community. Hello, Sharon Terry. I'm very glad that you are here with us today and uh, will tell you uh, us something about your work uh, because it's some, so extraordinary uh, uh, your impact uh, in science and uh, policy that uh, we really would like to hear from you personally. So first of all, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Sharon Terry, and I'm the president and CEO of Genetic Alliance, and also the founding CEO of PXE International. And um, of course, the, the, the story that, you're, the, that moved everything was this idea that uh, ethics must go together with science. We cannot uh, afford anymore to do science without ethics. And this is, of course, good when we are the owners of our own health. And this is a principle that is completely new. What was the, the moving factor to, to get there for you? So I think I was a fairly ordinary mom, uh, raising two children in the United States. Uh, in fact, I was homeschooling them, so we had very busy days of learning things together. Uh, but they were diagnosed when they were six years old and four years old with a uh, genetic disease called pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and it's PXE for short, so you don't have to say that. Um, and when they were diagnosed, uh, my husband and I figured Oh, you get a diagnosis and then you go to the pharmacy and you take the drug off the shelf and you treat the disease. And we learned very quickly that that was not the case. And it's not the case for many, many diseases, common and rare. Um, and we decided that if we didn't do something, then probably nothing would be done and we should work very hard uh, to figure out this disease and to see if we could find a treatment for it. Yeah, so I've read that you really went to the library uh, of a uh, university next to you and you were really doing research and reading what was already done in that direction and nothing was there. So you started yourself uh, a community on the internet in order to find uh, more information. I mean, how the, did it come? I mean, usually <laughs> it's not the first reaction so, uh, that you, know, you would expect. Uh, so uh, tell us, how do we activate ourselves like that? Yeah, my husband says that it is our neuroses uh, that we activate ourselves, that we couldn't sit still and just see what would happen. Um, I think we had taken charge of lots of things in our life up to that point in very small ways, and they were good practice for coming to such a big problem. Uh, we decided to look into it a little because it didn't seem like the doctor knew anything about it. Um, and then uh, asking more doctors, we realized there was very little research on it. So we did go to the medical libraries near us um, and we began to try to read the papers that were written. Neither of us had any science or medical background. And so even words like gene and recessive and uh, any of the medical terms were very difficult, so we found we had to buy an encyclopedia and then we had to buy a dictionary and then we had to ask some people. And so little by little, we amassed a lot of research uh, that was already done on the disease, but was done on one case here and another case there that really wasn't very accurate about the disease. Um, and soon realized that something systematic should be done, that you couldn't study a disease by just picking up one person in Germany, one person in the Netherlands, one person in the US, and writing stories about them. Yeah, so about this genetic revolution that it was at about that time, so it was really something that you, you took this opportunity to do something uh, with the genetic revolution and uh, with the internet possibilities. So you, you told today uh, at your speech that there is this incredible fragmentation, so something is doing, the, the doctor or the scientist is doing something, the patient is doing something because 
is uh, the carrying this gene and then there is like uh, maybe the relatives that is uh, doing something and carrying the patient here and there and some more uh, public health uh, uh, officer maybe uh, but it is much more uh, uh, efficient to bring everything together and this was your idea and your community the community that you started uh, how does this work um, how it would how w uh, was it possible to bring it to such um, and, and huge uh, amount uh, I mean, of members of this community? How did you do that? When we started, it was pretty difficult because this was 1994, 95. The internet was only just beginning. Uh, to look up even papers on the internet was difficult and not many people had email. So we started in somewhat traditional ways. Uh, we put notices in newspapers all around the world saying we're having a meeting of people with pseudoxanthoma elasticum and we weren't really having a meeting but people called us and wrote to us and began to tell us where they were because they were so excited. We then began to connect them so they could have meetings in those places in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Italy, uh, in the US. And then the internet started to take off and people started to have email more and more, especially um, AOL and Hotmail and some of these early uh, ways of communicating. And it became easier for us to uh, put up a website and have people email us to ask for information we also put brochures in ophthalmologists' offices because the condition has, a, has an eye manifestation, so an ophthalmologist was a good specialist to communicate with, and he or she would communicate with the patients. And we went from maybe finding 10 people in the U.S. to now having about 4,000 worldwide which is not a lot of people for a condition, uh, but it's only one in 100,000 people or so, and so that's, uh, that's quite a lot of people, and many people have met another person at least, and maybe a couple more people because of us holding meetings uh, all over the world. Um, it was difficult, but uh, the kind of thing that when you saw the joy on people's faces, when they saw, you know, at age 52, they would meet their first person with this condition, and they were no longer alone, uh, it was amazing to see that kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. And can you tell uh, us a bit, um, now that you are a specialist, something about uh, you know, science at, as a marketplace, the genetic revolution, and the fact that this uh, rare disease uh, cannot really, are not really worth uh, to work on or develop uh, new drugs. Uh, so uh, can you tell us something about that as a specialist now? So in the almost 20 years since the kids were diagnosed, it's uh, been a great change. When they were diagnosed, we were in the mid-90s, in the middle of the race to sequence the human genome. And so the work that was being done on that was very important because it was the first science in the biomedical field that was shared. So the idea there was that every night, all of the scientists working on sequencing the genome would put all of their data onto a website so everyone could see it the next morning. And so that revolution was huge. And it also started to help us understand disease. So the gene for this disease could be discovered and the gene for lots of diseases could be discovered. At the same time, these rare diseases were not being paid attention to by the pharmaceutical companies. The pharma companies in the 90s and even the 2000s were much more interested in heart disease, diabetes, big cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, because they could make what is called blockbuster drugs. So the marketplace was rich with blockbuster drugs making big companies a lot of money. We saw in the uh, end of the 2000s, and beginning of this decade, um, the genomic revolution amazing, uh, giving people lots of information about their genes and even how their bodies react to drugs and all sorts of things. And at the same time, the end of blockbuster drugs, in part because of genetics. So if you think about, you take a major disease like diabetes or breast cancer, and then you figure out everybody's different genetic makeup, you've now made a common disease into lots and lots of rare diseases. And so these diseases start to suffer the same plight of a rare disease, which is if you're only serving 4,000 people, 8,000 people in the world, then how do you make money? And what we see now are most pharmaceutical companies are opening rare disease divisions to try and see can we make a niche drug for a niche population and see how we could make enough money. 
Right now, they're trying to uh, make those drugs cost a lot of money. That's the model. I don't think that's going to hold up because if all of us need very expensive drugs, the different governments will not pay for those drugs. The payers in the United States won't pay for those drugs. And so I think we're in another revolution where we're going to have to learn how, how to make drugs more inexpensively. And part of that's going to be getting enough people uh, on board to give their data to science so that that part is less expensive and is done much more quickly. Mm -hmm. But what is uh, also very fascinating is that in the end you are now the owner of this gene because you were working together with a researcher uh, on this uh, gene P PXE uh, and you are actually the only private person who owns a gene. Um, how comes? It was very interesting that we got to work in the laboratory, usually mostly my husband between 10 a.m. 10 p.m. And, and 4 a.m. in the morning would be in the laboratory uh, working on trying to find the gene. And together with University of Hawaii uh, scientists, we discovered the gene. And when the gene was discovered, we realized it would be patented. And in the 90s, lots of people patented lots of genes. Um, now those patents don't hold up as much anymore. Uh, but in the 90s, if a university patented the gene or if a company did, they could actually lock up the gene and make it cost a lot of money for the diagnostic test or for therapies later on. And so we decided to be the steward of the gene, and I became the first and I think still only private individual who doesn't have scientific training uh, to patent a gene. And then we assigned our rights uh, to the foundation, to PXE International, so that PXE International holds the patent uh, and makes decisions about the gene. For example, to license it freely and to make sure that data is shared if someone is using the gene. Mm, this is incredible. <laughs> Thank you for being uh, such a model for many others, I hope. Um, you mentioned uh, now, as a couple of minutes ago, how important could be big data for a new kind of perception of health or control of health. Uh, you know, here in Europe, we are a bit scared about this big data, NSA, and all this what's going on, or the power of Google or a corporation like that. Uh, can you tell us a bit more why it is so important to collect the data in your opinion? So in my opinion, the data as each of us walk around with it is only important to us and we can't make sense of it. So if we think about whether it's how fast a broken ankle healed or how our cancer's responding to chemotherapy or whether our two next door neighbors on either side of us are responding differently to arthritis medicine, we can't figure that out with just that individual. We're only going to figure it out when we bring all that data together and then also look at those individuals as individuals. So it's a conundrum in a way that we need both the little data, which is the individual, and we also need all the data to come together. Now there are lots of concerns around data coming together because big data sounds scary. It sounds like, well, then people can find out things about me or they can misuse that data and I don't have any right to say what's happening. And so we're very concerned that people have the right to say who can share my data, who can see it, how private is it, and who has access to it, that individuals themselves make the decision about who can use the data. Yeah, but um, there is something um, um, very um, um, forward, what, what you mentioned also in your speech here. Um, I, I like that very much, that you say nowadays, when you talk about passion, it's not anymore uh, so important uh, informed consent in order you know to uh, treat um, a disease or uh, you know prevent a disease but it could be useful to think about a relationship and interaction uh, can you tell us also about that what you think I think in an age when we didn't have the internet, it was important to have something like consent, which usually was a piece of paper, someone signed their name on it and gave permission for something to be done and it was gone from them. Um, we now know that that one snapshot of data, that's it, that moment, 
is not as useful as having data over a long period and also having an engagement with the participant. So scientists complain that only about 4% of individuals, 5% participate in clinical trials, but that's because we don't know about them. Most of us don't know that the drug on the pharmacy shelf got there because somebody was in a clinical trial. And so if we can be engaged rather than just in a transaction, you know, it's not like renting a car or buying a house, it's like being in a relationship, understanding what do I have to give, what are you going to give me, how are we going to go back and forth, and what will it look like over time, and set up a system that allows us to do that, then the data, I think the data speaks. The data starts to tell the story over time of lots and lots of people, and then we can apply that back to the individuals from which the data came. Yeah, thank you for that too. Um, because of your extraordinary uh, uh, commitment, you were chosen as a Ashoka Fellow. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? How does it work uh, being an Ashoka Fellow? Uh. Ashoka is a worldwide entrepreneurship foundation uh, founded by a fellow named Bill Drayton and named after the Indian Ashoka. Uh, it is a foundation which recognizes social entrepreneurism. There's lots and lots of entrepreneurism in the world, and most of it is tied, I think, to commercial or to uh, profit kind of motives. And in this case, we're recognized uh, for social entrepreneurialism. So, in other words, what Ashoka looks for and vets are people working in the social sector, doing good, and it can be for profit or not for profit, NGO, uh, either one. Uh, but that they're actually making a contribution. And Ashoka has a wonderful process where they help you realize what kind of uh, entrepreneur you've been all your life. They look for you have been an entrepreneur since you were a child. Uh, they kind of trace that with you through your life uh, during the vetting process. And then they look at your ideas. Are they really novel? Are they really going to contribute to social and, and uh, great benefit for humankind? Um, and are they the kind of thing that could be sustainable or scalable? Uh, and then Ashoka supports the fellows, sometimes financially, uh, for a couple of years, and then certainly, more importantly, in fact, uh, through networks, through uh, gatherings, through resources uh, of sharing uh, information with each other, new ways of working, new business models, uh, that sort of thing. And there are now about uh, 3,000 fellows in the world, uh, most of them not in the United States, although the United States fellowship is growing. Um, and the people working in it have largely not been in health as well, although Ashoka is really concentrating now on more fellows in health. Yeah, it's uh, very, I think, very fascinating for everyone uh, to listen a bit more because maybe you hear here and there, but uh, you don't know exactly. So uh, thank you for that too. Um, you are, um, as you said uh, in your introduction, you are also the CEO of the Genetic Alliance. Um, how does this work? How is uh, your work there? And what do you like especially in uh, doing this work? Genetic Alliance is a very large coalition network of about 10,000 organizations worldwide. Uh, lots of them are disease advocacy organizations. Our roots were in helping disease uh, support groups, that sort of thing. I came to it when it was about 10 years old. Uh, it will be um, about 30 in another two years. Um, it, so it's an old organization, but it has kept itself very fresh. I like working with it because very shortly after my husband and I started to work on PXE, we realized that it was probably pretty futile to work on one disease and to try to make inroads in that one disease. For one thing, the science dictates that these diseases are all interconnected and that we have to understand this disease and that disease to make sense. When we discovered the gene, it's in the same family as cystic fibrosis. Nobody ever made connection between an eye disease and a lung disease, and so now we have a new way to look at the disease. That's just one example of how interconnected it is in the science. And then we also looked at it as, as a, a family trying to start a foundation. Why were we creating a board of directors and finding an accountant and a bookkeeper and an auditor when every other foundation had to do that? And wasn't that a waste of money? So with Genetic Alliance, we looked at how can we provide te technical assistance to the various groups so that they're sharing best practices, learning from each other. And then most excitingly for me, I do love that work, 
But lately what we've been doing is looking at how do you empower individuals to reclaim their health? So everything from parents in the newborn period understanding what is newborn screening and what are my options for screening before I even conceive a child? What am I being offered? How do I understand it? What do we understand through the lifespan when we now start to look at whole genome and whole exome screening? What is that going to mean to us as people as we carry our genome and it's unraveling, it's un, it's, uh, as we unravel the mysteries of our own genome? And then, particularly for me lately, this idea that if we could all get in a registry and a registry systems and start to share data broadly, we would solve these problems of various diseases much more quickly. So the thing that excites me most about Genetic Alliance is the opportunity to work in a network without boundaries, to forget about one disease or one organization or one organ system, and instead work in a kind of systems architecture that I think is going to really work much, much more quickly toward the solutions we all want to see. So is, um, is this um, a kind of work, uh, maybe you could, you could just talk about how does uh, it look like uh, one day, of, uh, one working day or one working week? Because this, also these practical things could be also very interesting for people that would like to do something similar. How does it look like? Do you have, uh, yeah, just tell us. Uh, so we have a staff at Genetic Alliance of about 15 of us. Uh, some people have been at Genetic Alliance, like myself, 10 years, so we've worked together a long time, and others are new. Um, we work on a whole host of projects, some of us looking at how do we educate the public. So a day might be spent putting together a workshop on um, family history. Family history turns out to be one of the greatest genetic tests anyone can take, just learning how to ask your family about what runs in your family and what might have been important and what, what recipes were important and the family might tell you something about predispositions in health. Um, other things we might do are work with federal agencies and global agencies. So I'm here, in fact, in Berlin meeting with the International Rare Disease Research Consortium which was set up by the EU Commission, Wellcome Trust, NIH, a whole host of entities. There are many, many countries coming together in this meeting, and I work on policy issues. So we work on what does data sharing look like across the globe, across these many, many different government ideas about privacy and security and that sort of thing. Even what do we call each of these diseases. We call them different names in different countries, and it isn't even language, it's just completely different names. Um, and how do we harmonize that data? How do we start to have standards so the data can talk to each other? So a typical day for us ranges from high-level policy work, where we might even go to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., <laughs> and meet with senators and representatives, uh, or even the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to uh, talking to a family on the phone who wants to start a new foundation and just learn that their child has a, a disease that they can't cope with right now. Oh, it's very exciting, very widespread. <laughs> um, and what about the biobank? Um, just uh, explain us, uh, could you explain us, what is this exactly, the biobank? Genetic Alliance Registry and Biobank was founded in 2003, and it was founded on the back of the biobank that I established for PXE in 1995. And so in that case, we discovered that there were very few samples to do gene discovery or understand the disease better, and we started to put together both uh, various uh, biopsies and organs that had been surgically removed for different reasons and, and DNA. And we realized it was silly to put that together for one group uh, for one disease and not share the infrastructure across all diseases. And so in 2003, we established Genetic Alliance Registry and Biobank, and that allows any disease to bank information, health information, and uh, biological samples from their members in one structure. And it's kind of run like a co-op. So in other words, each disease doesn't have to go find freezers and you know storage and backup systems and all those things. Genetic Alliance contracts with uh, a, a company to do that and then get, sells shares, sells memberships in the bank so that they can help the other groups uh, learn how to do that as well. 
It's um, run by lay people, which is an odd thing in science again, um, but we find it an easy thing to do. Uh, it's essentially, you know, it's like any other kind of banking. If someone takes care of the technical part, uh, we take care of the people part and help the people to learn how to do outreach to their own members and encourage people to sign up and put their DNA in the bank and put their health information in the registry. Mm. Uh, this high science is sometimes like a fortress. Uh, how did you how did you manage, <laughs> or how do you deal with this at all, <laughs> to get there as a not non scientist, but still to have such a impact? How do you do that? I like to say that uh, science is done in an ivory tower because it's done in the ancient academic systems that are amazing, uh, but it's also a cottage industry. So there are some cracks in the ivory tower walls, and they are that the scientists who are doing the work in those ivory towers and those big academic institutions are human beings. And they love, love, love people who are encouraged and engaged. They love sharing what they're doing. And so what we did is we simply read a paper and hardly understood it, looked at where is the scientist? Oh, the scientist is in Modena, or the scientist is in Utrecht, or the scientist is in Darmstadt. And we would actually go to the city and ask the scientists, could we meet with you? Call them up set up an appointment, and they were very, very generous with their time. And now they form a consortium of scientists interested in this disease. And then when we started to expand our work to other diseases and to governments and to the EU Commission, again, big fortresses, not accessible to ordinary people like me. Uh, but we found, again, people really want to help. And the opportunity to do something that's entrepreneurial, different than they usually do day to day, but also applies the skills they already have so they feel pretty comfortable, was a great mashup of the novel and the traditional. And so I think we were really able to see um, that the walls of the ivory towers could come down enough for us to be part of what was happening behind them. Oh, this is really great. Um, I, um, I have now a question related to your children. How are they now? My children would tell you that they're happy and healthy adults. Uh, they're 26 and 24 years old now. Um, that my daughter teaches for something called Teach for America, which is like a kind of Peace Corps uh, right in the U.S. doing work in uh, underserved communities. And my son is an organic farmer. Um, they both have manifestations of the disease. And for PXE, that means that uh, the membrane behind their eye has cracks in it that could lead to vision loss when they're around age 30 or 40. Uh, their skin has lesions, bumps in it that make it look saggy and old, wrinkled. Um, and they could possibly have cardiovascular and gastrointestinal features of the disease. Our daughter is in a clinical trial at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, uh, one that we helped to set up. Uh, so we're hopeful that that will be useful to them. Um, but they have been very philosophical about this all the way through. Um, we've asked them periodically, you know, we're giving up working full time on this disease to work on all diseases and they are grateful for that. They believe that it is important that our work be bigger than just their disease, and they know we're risking that we won't find a solution for their disease as fast as possible, although they, like us, believe probably will find it faster by working on all the diseases at once. <sighs> Yeah, you have told us so many fascinating things, <laughs> really. Um, what is uh, about all this, uh, what is the, one of the most important or the most or some very important issue for you? I think the most important issue for me is how each of us can be present to what we have. Um, what I've learned watching lots and lots of people suffer with disease over all these years is that each of us uh, is at our core the same as each other in the sense that we want to be seen, we want to be loved, we want to be present to another. And the most important thing to me is that kind of authenticity, that kind of being with each other and in the moment, because that's all we have sometimes, um, and being uh, authentic with each other. And what is your next project uh, you're working on now, uh, or in the future? Better. All my energy these days gets poured into this registry system that allows individuals to set their own privacy sharing and data access preferences. 
I am giving everything I can to finding a sustainable financial model for it and to gathering enough people that we can start to do clinical trials at a rapid pace. Uh, so I think this is a kind of almost culmination of many things I have done over the last 20 years uh, and is a really exciting time because the technology, the genetics, the social science, the networks, the social networks are all coming together at the same time to make it possible for us to advance science much more quickly. So for me, uh, the most exciting and amazing thing is that science can actually be on the level of the people and that everyone can participate. You don't even have to create a foundation anymore. You can just be yourself, share your data, and really contribute deeply to science. And do you have a message to uh, social entrepreneurs or people, some of our youths are maybe that want to become social uh, entrepreneurs? My message to social entrepreneurs, particularly young ones, budding ones, is to really risk. And that sounds like a crazy thing in a way, but by that I mean that every time we feel in ourselves that tension that says, this might not be a good thing to share, or I might look silly if I say this, or someone may think less of me because it doesn't look like I know something, to go ahead, because I think those are the things that break down walls and get us all to new levels. Uh, that if we are not worried about our ego, about our position, about where we're going in terms of career, I think we'll make better breakthroughs. And I think the more that each of us risk, just like all the people who suffer risk every day, uh, the quicker we'll make these advances and be able to find solutions for each other. Ah, so uh, now as the owner of a gene, <laughs> or the only private person, you are very uh, close to the mystery of life. Uh, so please tell us in the end, what does really matter in life? What do you think? So I think the only thing that matters in life is love. That every one of us loving one another will make a difference in the world. And even in our organization, even as we sit in our staff meeting, we're not afraid to say that as we move through the various levels of things we have to do, from talking to a mother on the phone, to creating a database, to looking at security coding, uh, that all of that should be manifestations of love. And when we love each other, uh, we will find not only ourselves, but each other. Thank you so much and for the time and for this uh, incredible inspiration and for all your work. I wish you very much uh, joy and uh, that you have the strength to continue. Uh, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.